Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and this is AP Physics Essentials, video 96. It's on the conservation of angular momentum. Now, how is angular momentum different from linear momentum? Remember, angular momentum is due to rotation. And you might think to yourself, why does the Earth continue to rotate? It's due to the conservation of angular momentum. It still maintains some of that angular momentum from the formation of the solar system. It's gradually slowing down and it'll eventually stop, but it's not something that we have to worry about. So conservation of angular momentum will always be maintained as long as we have no net external torque acting on an object or acting on the system itself. Now, unlike linear momentum, we can calculate angular momentum in one of two ways. If it's a point object in rotation, then our angular momentum is equal to the radius times the linear momentum of the object. So how fast it's going in this direction times its mass. If we've got an extended object, we use a different equation. If we're an extended object, the angular momentum is equal to the moment of inertia, so that's how much material we have and how far it's spread out from the center, times the angular velocity of the object. But in both cases, as long as there's no net external torque acting on it, the angular momentum before equals the angular momentum we have after. Now again, there are analogs for linear momentum. Remember, in linear momentum during a collision like this, the momentum is simply transferred between the two. Now in linear momentum, linear momentum equals mass times the velocity of the object. But we have analogs when we're talking about angular momentum. So if we've got a rotating disk like this, how do we calculate its angular momentum? Well, our, our equation is L equals I times omega. In other words, the angular momentum equals the moment of inertia times the angular velocity. Let's say we have a point object like this in rotation. Then we're going to use a different equation. Now L equals RP, where R equals the radius, the distance from the center. And then this is going to be the linear momentum. It's the linear momentum we were talking about just a second ago. So that's going to be a product of the mass times the velocity. Now let's look at this qualitatively. Let's say we have a tether ball. So it's a ball attached to a string, and it's rotating around a pole like this. And then we were to quickly shorten up the radius. What would happen to the speed? it's going to go much faster. OK, now that does kind of make sense, but why does that happen? Well, this was our angular momentum before. It was a product of the radius times the linear momentum. Now we've decreased r, but our l is going to stay the same. So we're decreasing r. What do you think happens to the mass? The mass has to stay the same. And so what happens to the velocity of the sphere? It's going to go up, so it's going to go way faster. We could apply the same thing to an extended object. Let's say we're looking at a figure skater, and they're pulling their arms in. So let's say they're rotating, so it's an extended object. So they're rotating fairly slowly. And then what happens when they pull in their arms? Well, we're pulling more of that mass towards the center. And so what's happening in this case, we're decreasing the moment of inertia. So what's going to happen to our angular velocity? It's going to speed up. And so the, the, the angular momentum is conserved. It's just that we're increasing the angular velocity because we decrease that moment of inertia. And so we could do this quantitatively as well. Let's say we have an object. Now we'll do a little bit of math. So this is the radius from the center. This is the linear um, velocity, how fast it's going in that direction, and then this is going to be the mass. And so first of all, let's calculate the angular momentum before we change the system. And so I'm going to plug in, here's my radius, here's my mass, and then here's going to be my linear velocity. So I could calculate my angular momentum, and I'm going to leave all the significant digits in it. Because we're going to see what happens if we take the radius and we cut the radius in half. So we're going to decrease that radius. So now it's 0.16 meters. And so I know this. I know my initial angular momentum. And now we're going to solve for my angular momentum after we've reduced the radius. And so I could plug in these values. It's now 0.16 here. The mass stays the same. But now we have a new final velocity. And so we could solve for that final velocity, and it's going to be twice the speed that it was before, before it was 3.0 meters per second. We could do the same thing if we have an extended object like this. So let's say we have a rotating disk. It's got an angular velocity of 9.2 radians per second. Let's say it has a moment of inertia of 13 kilogram meters squared. And so let's say we take an identical disk as it's spinning, and we drop it on it from above. 
What's going to happen to the angular velocity? Well, try to solve this one, and I'll put an answer down in the video description down below. But did you learn to make qualitative predictions about what happens to an extended object or a point object as we change it due to uh, conservation of angular momentum? And then finally, could you make calculations related to angular momentum when there's no net external torque acting on it? I hope so, and I hope that was helpful.